like balderdash except it's not uh i am chris <laughs> jazz sequence on the internet that's jazz sequence with a three uh i am most wait wait wait, wait 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 it's a silent three between the words where does the three fall the three is in the sequence the first e or the second e the first e or in place of another letter in place of a in place of an e it's the first e it's the first e okay i didn't mean to derail you I just didn't realize there was a three in there. Totally, totally. Well, I mean, it's it. It depends on the platform. I started off with as jazz sequence. I mean, jazz sequence with a three, and then as I joined other things later, um, I started just defaulting a jazz sequence because my domain is jazz sequence. And I actually had somebody say that they were confused about my email address because they assumed that my email address had a three in it because that was my Twitter handle. And so then I had to go out and purchase jazz sequence with a three and have it direct to, to jazz sequence without a three. It's very confusing. Um, confusing with a three, got it. I am, I am most recently uh, a, the proud uh, possessor of a uh, DDoS uh, threat email, uh, ransom email, uh, that if I, don't, uh, if I don't pay 0.02 Bitcoin, uh, the next uh, by 8 p.m. tonight, then one of my sites is going to get DDoSed. What is 0.02 Bitcoin in real currency? It's like a hundred and like, change. It's like 120 bucks or something. Yeah, I wouldn't pay it. No, <laughs> I mean I would pay. It, I would pay it if it was a, a nickel. But I mean I so wouldn't pay it anyway. I would pay it if it was a nickel. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm joined. I, are you, I'm, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Are you, are you, do you have some kind of like load balancing? Are you using Cloudflare I or Cloudflare. are you? I have Cloudflare. And actually yeah. one of the dudes at Cloudflare, uh, probably cause I mentioned them in my tweet, uh, jumped on uh, Twitter and asked me um, to email him the, the, the ransom email uh, just so he could look at it. And he's like, yeah, that's bullshit. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, I'm joined as always by uh, Gary, who is binary Gary on the internet. Uh, and he is a valued customer. Uh, I'm also joined by Allison, <laughs> yes. who is Allison Plus on the internet, and she is a valued customer. Um, <laughs> oh, man. Chris, valued good. customer, good to see you. <laughs> also, I like to think that, um, that the podcast is really what brought you to the forefront to, to be ransomed, ransomed, you know? Like, I think... I think the popularity levels are so high that you just, you know, that's like the tallest blade of grass is the one that gets cut. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will continue I to believe though, that. I feel as though um, if our domain were to be ransomed, binaryjazz.us, where you can ask questions as a listener. Um, Good plug there. I feel, I, I, right? It's like, it's, it only took 10,000 episodes or so, but I'm starting to feel like a momentum, a groove, like, some ownership of this of this portion of the vessel, as it were. Um, I, I feel as though if we were being held ransom for a DDoS, we would um, we would probably want it to happen, just <laughs> for the sheer nerd aspect of like, what does it look like from a load perspective? And um, you know, I'd be curious. Yeah, that domain is actually on uh, on DigitalOcean. So if if it did happen, and I mean, DigitalOcean has some really nice uh, tools to visualize um, the CPU load and all that sort of stuff. So if it did actually happen, you know, like it would be something that could could be looked at. Um, but I imagine and, and the Cloudflare thing in between is probably gonna yeah do something. Effective. Yeah, maybe maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. Although I suppose if you could. If you had your wits about you, you could figure out the IP address of the server and just go straight at that and hit the other, you know, 12 sites that run on the same droplet and uh, cause all sorts of mayhem on the internet for the dozens of What was interesting about the email surfing those sites. What was interesting about the email is it was sent by anonymous at anonymous.com. 
but who are uh, they? Well, and they said we are the anonymous, we are anonymous hacking hacker collective or hacking group or something. And I'm like, uh, yes, yeah, sure you are. And and what's funny is that anonymous.com redirects to uh, anonymous media research, which is just a really boring <laughs> media research company. <laughs> that that when you go to anonymous.com, it takes you to to their website, and and it. it I, I considered momentarily that the website was just a shell because it was so just nondescript and, and boring, but no, I actually think it's, pr I think that's probably an insult to the people who work there because I think it probably is real. And, and I feel very bad for saying their site was kind of boring and, and nondescript, but I don't know. I, maybe if your name Knowing is anonymous, the and that's works. the point of, of, the, of your yeah. website. Knowing how the internet works, I was gonna say, well, we can live without fear that they will, you know, they will hear this podcast uh, because they will not. <laughs> but how the internet functions, I feel that there's a very good likelihood that they will now hear this podcast. Yeah. At least this episode. As well, a it, what's, funny, this what's funny is that the email said, uh, if, you, if you go to the media to try to uh, publicize this and make a quick buck or something, then you will be DDoSed immediately. And... Um, so then, so of course the first thing I do is post it on Twitter and then I'm like, Hmm, so is Twitter the media? <laughs> like, I don't know. But is I'm this podcast that, the media? <laughs> Twitter. I am the media. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I think, I think we could be considered media. We we're talking we're about it and we're broadcasting. And I think this listen. will just make your evening that much more interesting. Well, and it's right. It's the night before I go on a 14 hour drive. So I won't get to see what happens tomorrow. <laughs> maybe, maybe your site will be down for a little yeah. bit. Oh well. <sighs> all those uh, gifts. Yeah, all those gifts. Yeah, <laughs> it, it would be a shame if the gifts were gone. Oh, you gotta protect them. <laughs> Whoa! Wait. Oops. A lot of buttons on this thing. This card. All right. <laughs> retweet. Do not retweet. And publicize <laughs> this. I do have to comment. Please. Like normal, Gary's backdrop for people who do happen to check the video feed almost looks fake and picturesque, like a weird painting is behind you. Mm, yes, like a diptych because it's divided in two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I'm actually, I'm in the garage and this is just a screen I pull down. <laughs> I would believe it, except I'm sure at some point those clouds will move, maybe. I don't know. We'll have to. We'll have to see. Maybe we it can watch the video in the pull down screen. <laughs> Maybe Gary Club, twenty eighteen. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, if you can do the show, we uh, come on and we talk about some stuff uh, that Gary and I know nothing about or don't know at least the topic ahead of time. Allison will bring us a topic, and we will attempt to uh, describe and identify and discuss said topic uh, without previously knowing what it is, and possibly not even knowing what it is after we know what the topic is, <laughs> not any know anything about the topic, and then we just make shit up because uh, if we don't know what it is, then we just, that's what we do. So, Dyson yeah. Sphere. Dyson Sphere. Dyson Sphere part two. <laughs> nope. Best of. <laughs> uh, it was best of. It was all worst. 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 Sorry. <laughs> I, I tried to tee that up and it was all, the timing was terrible. Pretend it was a good joke about like sausage. There's Sorry. a sausage pun in there. Yeah, we've been over this. <laughs> I never saw such a terrible joke. Well, I'm satisfied. Oh, okay. The topic this week <laughs> is Bildungsroman. Excuse me? It's spelled B-I-L-D-U-N-G-S-R-O-M-A-N. Bildungsroman. Yeah. <laughs> is this the thing it's where- It's not even in English. <laughs> How am I supposed to know Esperanto that? Esperanto wasn't either, but that didn't well, stop us. Yeah, you, can well, break, yes. you can break this down into its, its parts, I think, in true binary jazz fashion. Um, <laughs> say it one more time. Building, build, building. Building's Roman. Uh, constructing is, is the building portion, right? Uh, 
Love, I do, this I is, do enjoy a good deep sigh. That's the sign that I've done my job well. <laughs> this isn't that thing the Mormons do, right? When they, no. Uh, like, okay. I thought it was but I would like to. Up. I would like to hear the, the rest of that question. Yeah, what is the thing the Mormons do? There's many things. <laughs> With their, the Mormons do like when they go out and sow their wild oats. What's that called? Sow their oh, wild you're oats. Thinking, um, what the Amish do. Yep, I am. I totally am. <laughs> Not the Mormons. Mormons. Yep, totally missed there. Wrong ballpark. My apologies for all our Mormon listeners. I mean, yeah. <laughs> If there are if there are Mormon <laughs> listeners, I'll just keep that thought in my head. Um, well, uh, my apologies to our Amish listeners. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, if they're Amish, I don't know that they'd be listening anyway. I hope Technology, so. if yeah. technology their, and all. If they're on their if they're on their buildings, Roman, they might be. Yeah. Right. It's true. What is that called, though? It's something similar, right? It's 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 two bisyllabic words in German, is it not? Yeah. It's almost Rumspringa. the same damn thing, then. I mean, there's virtually no difference. You're thinking Rumspringer. Yeah, not even the right amount of syllables. No. Yep. <laughs> no. Well, all right, I'm totally out of ideas on this. I, one. I, I, uh, build, build it. it has nothing to do with buildings, I know that. Well, I think building in Ger buildings in German is, is like, uh, to me, it's like to make, right? Is it even German? Can we, can, we get, can we get, is it really actually German? <laughs> it's like a spelling bee where you're like, may I have the origin of the <laughs> Yes. Can you please use the word in a sentence? <laughs> My building's Roman. Yeah, that was, you walked into that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, oh, look at the clouds. I'll, they have moved. They have indeed moved. They have moved. The clouds there have moved. You go. Good, yeah. good, good distraction, Gary. Good clouds. <laughs> Uh, all the German I know comes from Einstein's and they know about which is a German experimental. Well, that's certainly, uh, which is an ex German, a German experimental band, uh, in, in the eighties and early nineties. And their name means collapsing new buildings. Uh, so I know that, I know that it does not mean there, that building is not part of the buildings. Ramen, building is not because building. Bauten is building because Neubauten. I like this detective work, this yeah. narrowing down. You're um, like, it's not building. It's not that. <laughs> well, I have a confession. Yes. I took four semesters of German in high school. And, <laughs> and I have no idea obviously what that, that means Obviously, that helped you a lot, Gary. Well, you had to have foreign language credits to graduate. Um, so everybody took Spanish, except for the Greek students who took Greek because it was easy. And then the really like smart students all took Latin, which left German and French as languages you could take, but only if enough students enrolled. Um, I don't think enough enrolled in French for a French class. Course. But somehow enough enroll enrolled in German. And it was like every semester, it was the same like 14 students. It was the weirdest class because I, I had all these different classes, but German, it was the same 14 students because really, I mean, it wasn't like it was a popular language. And I, I don't know, Spanish just seemed like, eh, it's kind of boring. Like, I, can, I don't know. I don't know, I, but I know more Spanish now than German. I'm not saying a lot. But. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I took Italian in high school for four years. And I went to Italy. Four years. Wow. Four years. Yeah, all four. Uh, and I went to Italy uh, for a couple weeks during that period of time. Uh, and so when I went to Italy uh, a couple months ago, several months, many months ago, many moons ago uh, for a comedy retreat, I did know some Italian. I was able to communicate. And uh, yeah, that was actually surprising. And, and actually, I picked up more as, I, as things. And I tried to speak it as much as I could. But I'm sure I just had... came off as an American speaking Italian. But a better, a better an American speaking Italian than a dipshit who doesn't speak anything who <laughs> doesn't even make the attempt <laughs> yeah um we we had a we had frau cosmo my first two semesters and she i don't know why she was teaching high school because i mean she she was also teaching at the local community college but i mean very clearly like not only multilingual i don't know she spoke, but a good educator um but couldn't really handle like you know rowdy high school kids so after a year, she said, 
to hell with this in German. Um, and, and left. And then we got Herr Lugenbuhl, who was like the quintessential German looking dude. I mean, like he would shave in the morning, and by the time he got to school at 7.30, he would have like a five o'clock shadow. I mean, he was just so German. Um, <laughs> and um, That's a German and he was thing. great. I, I, I don't know. I didn't realize I, that was a German trait. <laughs> I feel like it made him feel more German, though. Like he had like five o'clock shadow on his very German jowl. Everything about him was German. He felt just so authentic. Um, he was from Switzerland. <laughs> but, um, but he really was. Um, well, he's but, probably from like Kansas. <laughs> no, was, like, I'm fairly certain Switzerland. It, making a go of it. <laughs> yeah. But he was, he was wonderful um, and actually sort of knew how to deal with students. Um, and then had like a massive heart attack and, and had, we had like a substitute teacher that knew no German for a while until here in came back. Um, and uh, I don't blame any of my deficiencies in German on either one of those teachers or his heart attack. I was just a lazy student. It was my first class of the day every semester for a while. And, you know, whatever. My, I wish him well. I my Italian so teacher, somewhere. my Italian teacher was very, very Italian. Very, very Italian. Um, yeah, Signor Mata, except I can't roll my R's. I still can't roll my R's. I've never been able to roll R's, ever. Mm -hmm. But that's his name. It's Signor Mata with a rolled R in there that I can't do. Um, is this, what is the word, say the word again? My word or the- Yeah, your word. <laughs> no, 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 the, the, to the, the topic today. Bildungsroman. I mean, it sounds like, like Roman buildings. League, is it? No, it's Bundesliga. Okay. It's close. It's close. <laughs> There's lots of, like, good little trails happening linguistically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is and I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, to be honest. Um, so that could be... I could be throwing you off the scent. Oh, not even, not oh even no, I don't think that would be the way it's throwing us off the scent. I don't, I don't think the pronunciation <laughs> is a problem here. I'm like, my pronunciation is what's throwing you off. I'm sorry. <laughs> as soon as you explain it, it'll be like, oh, of course. Of course. Yeah. The Dung's Roman. I was going to say that today, but I forgot. Still. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot it was my shtick. I was supposed to go, oh, yeah, that's. And then. That's. Hang <laughs> well. You could still, but. Yeah. Oh yeah, team. that's and then Yeah, that's <laughs> totally. That's that thing the not more many Amish do. The not more I do Amish. I I like the idea of taking like a weird hiatus from life though. Like I mean obviously for in their culture it serves a much different purpose, but everybody should have the opportunity to rumspring a bit. <laughs> I feel like I'm like permanently doing that. <laughs> I'd watch that movie <laughs> instead of Gary on vacation. Just Gary on Rumspringa. It's like Groundhog's Day, except not. Yeah. Except the opposite. <laughs> well, like it's not like a torturous yeah. thing. It's like a it's pretty awesome, <laughs> enjoyable. Every day is the same, but it's nothing at the same time. Yeah. I, well, every well, day, so every day is a new thing. So, you, like, I mean, it's the same day, but like you do a different thing. Like today, I'm gonna go climb the Eiffel Tower. And you fly to Paris and you climb the Eiffel Tower. Okay, you wake up again. And today I'm gonna, you know, hike up the Alps. And so you go to hike up the Alps and, and next morning you wake up and I, yeah. I don't know. I even feel like just the mundane things that are different every day are really interesting. Like, here's a story that I think everyone finds would find boring, but I'm gonna tell it anyway. And Allison won't drop from the call because she's so we're not gonna lose all of our listeners. So yeah, here's <laughs> here's the deal. So I had um I've had these glasses for a while and the nose piece like broke in half because mm. I put it on it just it snapped and then it hurt to wear them so I went to like an old pair of glasses and they had a lot of problems with glare and stuff so I thought well I should replace the nose piece I don't need to buy new glasses yet so I took, I took my son we went to Walgreens and I found the glasses repair kit but they didn't have replacement nose pieces they just had like a screwdriver and some screws and crap um, so I bought a pair of readers that had very similar nose pieces um, or at least the one I could match because the other one had taken off or falling, like broken apart. Um, so, I mean, it, I like MacGyvered like replacement nose pads and it was super mundane, but he was like, well, how are we gonna fix it? You know, we get like a cheap pair of readers and you know, harvest the parts off of there. And like, that I, is- It was a great afternoon. And that is building drama. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit of MacGyvering and a bit of 
Is it the uh, story itself and, or the act of it's MacGyver? The ce- it's the God. celebration of mundanity. Huh. So here's another example. What an exciting sure. word for, for a Nazi. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't seem that exciting. Wrong, I keep forgetting it, but maybe it's the German. And I was just so trained in four semesters of high school to not remember German words. <laughs> like, so hard. That's the exact um, opposite effect that school is supposed to have. Well, depending on who you ask, I guess. So there was this. Uh, we, <laughs> I might argue we, that that is the like, exact. specific effect that school <laughs> actually. <laughs> we live in the power line, like power lines are right behind us. So. Um, Yesterday, they were out there mowing the power lines, and the kids were excited. They were in the backyard watching, because we're in Florida, so I think we see a lot of tractors, so out in the west where you drive past farmland. I mean, I don't, I can't think of any farmland in Duval County. I mean, there must be some, but, so they were out there watching the, uh, the tractor go by mowing the lawn. It makes, I don't know, dozens of passes. And this guy, like, comes to the edge of the yard and stops, and he tells the kids to go ask their mom if they can ride in the tractor. So he took them for, like, a mile, like, down and back in the tractor, telling them what was going on and showing them all about it and stuff. It was fantastic. Well, then at night, they leave the tractors parked somewhere. It's not even near the road. We'll mess with them. So he came back and parallel parked the tractor right up there so the kids could wander around and poke at it. Like, it's just a tractor. But it was so much fun to go out there with the kids and, like, you know, stand next to the tires that are taller than they are. And, you know, what is, why are there chains hanging in front of the mower blades? And, you know, like, that's it's mundane. It's a tractor. For many people, it's a common thing. But, you know, there it was. And super fun and exciting. 24 hours later, I'm talking about a tractor for crying out loud. There's, um, there's a couple sort of living farms uh, around Utah Valley and Salt Lake Valley. Uh, and one of them that we've been to a couple times, um, they you know have tractors you can climb on. They've got animals that you can visit and feed and they feed. And it's, it's, a, it's a farm, but it's also sort of like an amusement park. I mean, not like an amusement park, amusement park, like there's no rides, but like you go hang out with animals on the farm and there they are and they actually do like i think there's uh, a couple times a like at a particular time during the day they might like actually churn butter and do other thing other farmy type the animals churn the butter no the humans oh okay (laughs) (laughs) it's not the george i'm totally (laughs) disappointed i'm a little disappointed I was thinking, and like, there's, also, uh, there. I, I, there's also there's uh, also this is the place to... I think this is the place park it's called uh, I haven't been there the kids have been there a couple times and they have a blacksmith shop there and they actually do blacksmithy things um, and go there and they've got a freaking I don't know do blacksmithing yeah. things but uh, yeah making horseshoes and whatever and you can we stayed at a state park in Georgia last year I only know it because the name is cool called General Coffee. General coffee. They had animals and stuff there, but that's not notable. The notable is that general coffee. That's that's what was notable. <laughs> um, Your definition of notable versus mundane is fascinating to me. <laughs> because I, think we... no, I, I don't see them as very far apart. Are they? You know? No, they're not. They're pretty. I mean, on the continuum of things. In the world, I, love that I go like I go horizontal with my hand, <laughs> and you go vertical. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I think we should. I think we should get the the definition. Uh, par- partially Probably, because, par- yeah. partially because we're, we have we, a, we have a really no good headway. we have a really good question too, and I want to make sure that we have enough time to discuss this oh. really good question. Okay. So I so I do have a sort of a, 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 a word <laughs> and uh, uh, ulterior motive. That's right. that's the word um, for for wanting to do that. But also uh, we should actually you know discuss the actual thing that it is. For, before sure. we get on to the really good question. To the really good question. Okay, so Bildungsroman is a coming of age story. It's a literary term for English lit fans. Um, so things like uh, like Catcher in the Rye or... So that's what it is. It, it is a coming of age story, period. That is what it is. That is the description. So instead of saying coming of age story, it's a Bildungsroman. Yeah, because... Um, 
Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. So, so what Bill, an Amish person. Bill means education and Roman means novel. Okay. In so so when an Amish person is it, is goes on the Bundesliga. Like the protagonist goes on a journey of knowledge in which they increase that knowledge as the novel continues. German? German. Totally German. Well, we got that part right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it could have been it could have been Dutch, and I wouldn't have known. Right, I was a little worried that that was going to be the case after I talked a lot about like, my German class, and it wasn't going to be a German word. <laughs> it's archetypal German. It can't get more German than this. It's like, well, it's actually, actually, actually Japanese. Actually, it's Icelandic. <laughs> oh, <Ish. Crap>. awkward. <laughs> and obviously, like oh, yeah, a lot thinking. of novels fall into this category because. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Why is that a? What is um. Is there a difference? So, okay. Uh, is there a difference between that kind of story and the the Joseph Campbell um, hero's journey sort of thing? Or is a is that is the hero's journey a type of building's ramen? I think the hero's journey would fall into that, and there's probably like some sort of weird sub niche or category because I know yes. there's there's a different yes. I know there's a, um, a separate term for the artist's journey, which is Kunstelroman. Um, so I'm sure that there's like a niche for everything in this, in this world. <laughs> is, is the relatability of those stories what makes them popular? Like, well, I guess yeah. they're not all popular, but is, it, is the relatability why that is like a continued writing theme? I would Maybe. think so. And What's like the catharsis of actually getting your version of it on paper. Well, and like the hope for improvement that someone can actually like journey through and, and, and keep growing versus just be a stagnant character. And also like the idea that like everything revolves around the one protagonist. So like, mean, every, like the events and other characters like serve that person's growth, right? A, a story in which the main character never changes and stays the same is not is less interesting than a story where you can see the main character evolving over time. Mm -hmm. At least that's the common perception among writers. <laughs> and readers. And, and readers <laughs> I, don't, I, but... like, I wouldn't want to read a book where the character is just static. Because at the end of the book, you're going to be yelling at them like, dude, don't you ever learn? You never open that door. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And also, I guess, I guess the other thing is that five it's, it's, times you've opened the door in a giant octopus, ate your brain, and you haven't learned. You never understand. The octopus will always be behind the door. <laughs> but also, like, the octopus follows, a metaphor. Like, <laughs> like the timeline of like youth to like aged. Yeah. Aged. <laughs> well, it doesn't necessarily mean, mean elderly, just older. <laughs> Enhanced. Enhanced version of yourself. Oh. Huh. Oh. Huh. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this really good question it comes from Lisa. Uh, she sent it a while ago. And, and the reason why I wanted to give it time is because I actually had to Google the thing she was talking about in order to have an understanding of the question itself. So the question is, what gentrified food offends your sensibilities and what gentrified food can you get down on? And so first, I needed to look into what the hell is gentrified food or gentrification as it relates to food. So gentrification typically is a term that is used to describe like the evolution of a neighborhood. Like you, there's a poor neighborhood or typically historically poor neighborhood. And then like young millennials come in and they move in and they, they start building stuff and suddenly that neighborhood becomes really trendy and popular and it kicks out all of the, the low income people because they can no longer afford to live in this neighborhood that was historically low income. And this, this basically happened in the market in San Francisco, I know, and the Castro was like that. Things like that were like the gays came in and they made everything awesome and now nobody can live there anymore. Um, and so when it, it, when it applies to food, from what I have read, 
uh, it's basically taking some sort of like either cultural specific uh, a specific food to a particular culture or like maybe even like a vegetable that nobody really eats like kale and and then well, it becomes well, like super so trendy and and then like because every because everybody's like oh kale i'm Time gonna up. put that in my smoothie let me stop you there let me stop you right there kale. gary don't you dare kale is amazing <laughs> i'm about to bad mouth some kale like <laughs> kale is spinach with better pr <laughs> that's all it is kale is spinach with better marketing it's it's in is every it other way it is subservient to spinach i is is, is the marketing really better is it better, Gary? Or is it because people have like gotten sick off of spinach, so maybe their PR needs to do a bit, a bit more work. People have gotten sick off of kale. Kale, <laughs> the kale used to be used as a decoration in, in, uh, in uh, the, 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 the salad trough, for crying out loud. The garnish. And someone was like, we can sell that and people will eat it. <laughs> it's because it's delicious? So, so It's not. It's spinach is better in every way. So back texture. to food gentrification, although this does sort of uh, cross over into that, uh, one of the big sort of culprits uh, of the gentrification and the making trendy of particular, not particularly trendy foods is uh, Whole Foods. You go into Whole Ping Foods. death match, kale and spinach. <laughs> That's what I want. Go ahead, Whole Foods. <laughs> so you walk into Whole Foods and like everything is marked up a million percent. Uh, and it's all the same food that you get elsewhere. It's just like because it's Whole Foods and it's natural and organic and whatever. And, and so. Whole Foods so, is one Amazon bar, right? right? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, so, I think it's only like a half million percent at this point. But like if, if in my neighborhood, a gentrified food could be something totally different than in your neighborhood. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let's start with like a real clear baseline like Chinese food, like American Chinese mm -hmm. food is very clearly gentrified food. Yeah. I mean, there well, are Chinese the, places where you get Chinese food. One of, the things I was, one of the things I was reading is, is, is referring to food as ethnic. And I'm totally guilty of this. And I hadn't even thought about like the cultural implications of thinking of food as ethnic foods and like how that, because basically any food that's not from America is an, eth is an ethnic food. It has an ethnicity, like German food is ethnic food, Italian food is ethnic food, but we don't think of it as yeah. ethnic food. We think, typically we think of, of ethnic food as like Asian. Eastern East mostly. Yeah. yeah. And, and that in, in itself is, <laughs> is very, uh, word. <laughs> problematic yes that's not the word i was thinking of but yes i mean in short yes it is it is well it is problematic to think yeah. of it's it's a colonialist um to yes. be thinking of essentially groups of people uh as ethnic yeah well i want to i want to back up to to the the food types yes. just, kale. Just, just i want to like, back up to kale <laughs> i'm not done talking about kale and i probably never will be um I and mean, that might be what's on my headstone, right? Kale. Spinach, bigger than sign kale. That's it. That's, what's he remembered for? Hatred of kale, love of spinach. Hatred of kale, lover of spinach. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was, I got sidetracked there. Um, so, so I, like Italian foods are ones that we've like really like, it's Italian, very Americanized, right? Um, Chinese, very Americanized. Um, I feel like like Japanese food has become very American. It's obviously like California roll sushi. We're probably not doing a lot of California roll in Japan, I, I would think, guess. But I think Americanized is different than gentrified. Or I think there's okay. like different levels. Because I think one is like making it palatable to a larger population. Mm -hmm. And one is like then taking it maybe to another level and like co-opting it. Yes, but then selling it as, for instance, Japanese food, like, yeah. is sort of like cultural appropriation, right? Like, uh, it is an American version of Japanese food, but we're telling you it's Japanese food. And so it creates a sort of like expectation that if I went to Japan, I'd get exactly this stuff because this is Japanese food. Yeah. Which is very much so not the, the case. 
So, so repeat the question, because I don't think we've answered the question. So the question is, what question. gentrified food offends your sensibilities, and what gentrified food can you get down on? Okay. Mm. I don't know. There's a, there's a lot of assumption there that 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 that, I've been that we like gent to non that we like well, non gentrified food. like non gentrified versions of of different cuisine, right? Right. Um, yes. I thought like there's a lot of cases like I, I, Italian's a good example. I have not eaten in Italy. I've eaten a lot of Italian, U.S. and a lot of it is very clearly like there's some pasta and some red sauce and a shitload of cheese. Right. That's. I mean, uh, to be honest. Italian. Ita actual American Italian Irish, food right? is is pretty similar without like the layer upon layer upon layer of cheese. Yeah, we do, we do a little um, bit more on the cheese side on this side of the Atlantic than they do over there. That's more or less it's pretty much the same stuff anyway. Pasta is pasta. Um. Mm. So Chinese is one that I can totally get down on. Having eaten Chinese food in China. Mm. Texture is very big and like weird. I don't say I can't say weird. Textures that to me are weird um, are uh, interesting. Like, I would not. I I mean yeah, like a, a much wider gamut in expectations of texture. Um, you know, our, I feel like I'm cool with a lot of textures, probably more so than most folks in food. But but my expectations and tolerance of textures is nowhere near as broad as someone who's grown up on like local Chinese fare. So I would say uh, I would say that I can. I'm I'm down with uh, I'm down with gentrified Indian food because I feel like if I had authentic Indian food, it would probably make my head blow off of my neck. Um, and I'm I'm basing this on the fact that Aaron actually went to India and had actual food and was like nahe masala, <laughs> like all the time, and it was still really hot. So, oh, I don't know. But I mean, it's also like it's it, outside of the 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 realm of like specifically like what you're just calling categories of food, like like um, uh, cultural foods that have been brought over. Like there's also the th like things like kale or or I don't know. Uh, I, there's a thing I was reading about about chard about how chard is making a comeback. Like I didn't know that chard was a th like. I didn't know it had left. <laughs> exactly. And that's, that's sort of the point is like anything can be anything that you suddenly like, like, like the avocado toast thing. Like I didn't know it was a thing before. I didn't know that it was now a thing now. I don't know why people are excited about avocado toast. It's avocado on toast. I mean, avocados are awesome. They never I, I were not awesome toast. really. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. What what is the toast add? The to the toast the toast is not the star of this dish, clearly. My you know? my gentrified food that I can get down with is jackfruit. Hmm. Wow. I'm not sure I jackfruit. agree with you. I, I can I see your jackfruit, but I'm not sure I can agree with you. <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm totally down with it. <laughs> I cannot confirm nor deny. <laughs> we we um our vegan option at Work Camp Jacks last year, twenty seventeen, was um barbecue. Yeah, that's what we had at, at for Camp Salt Lake. Yeah. It was a uh, You're all uh, making as well as I would have liked. <laughs> Your word camps. <yes. laughs> it was it was not received as well as I would have hoped. It was actually I it should be received fantastic. pretty well. Yeah, it should be received pretty well at ours. Um the thing about Jackford, uh, the thing about the Jackford that we had at Work Camp Salt Lake City anyway, is it doesn't make particularly fantastic leftovers. And when I'm the one that's taking all the leftovers home, <laughs> day two, three, four, yeah, it starts to be like, okay, I'm I'm done with this now. Yeah. Yeah, the shelf life is pretty short. Yeah. Bulk bulk of jackfruit, not a good thing. <laughs> mm. <sighs> this was a fun question. Yeah. I feel like I'm still ruminating on it. Yeah, I know. I mean, we could do an entire episode on this. So thank you for the question, Lisa. I hope that we answered to your satisfaction. If we have not, please ask again, and we'll uh, attempt to answer it again. And if you think that it should be the topic for an entire episode, include that as well. Thank you for listening to Binary Jazz. If you like this episode, you can subscribe to us on iTunes or Google Play. You can visit us online at binaryjazz.us or follow us on Twitter at, at @binaryjazz. Don't forget that you can ask us a question through the forum on the website or on Twitter, and we'll read it aloud on the next episode of Binary Jazz.